Sam, you and I are fascinated by consciousness. I did a doctorate in neuroscience. Uh, you, you are a, a physician. Uh, you have taken a very interesting approach by studying consciousness during cardiac arrest. What can be learned about consciousness during what could be defined as a, a near-death experience? Well, you see, um, consciousness is really, I think, the most important question for us to try to address. And many uh, physicians, many researchers are looking at this from a different perspective, different angles. But first we have to define what we're talking about. What we're really discussing is what makes Sam into who he is, what makes Robert into who he is, or anybody else into who they are. Mm -hmm. So the self. And of course, as you know, from the time of the ancient Greeks, they called that entity the psyche, which was later translated into the word soul. But in effect, what it really means is the same terms for, for the different terms for the same thing, I should say. What is it that makes me into who I am? And today in science, we call that consciousness. Now, of course, there have been different opinions about consciousness because it is the biggest mystery. And some people have proposed that consciousness is essentially a product of bodily functions from Aristotle onwards. And others such as Plato have suggested that consciousness, the self, the soul, the psyche, whatever you want to call it, me, the, the self, is something separate from bodily processes. Certainly the predominance of opinion today, certainly among scientists, is that it is a bodily process. Absolutely. So most scientists have sort of leaned towards the Arist Aristotle's kind of viewpoint. Now, what's fascinating is that, and this is a big problem in science, is that you can never really separate consciousness from brain activity. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Which one come, comes first? They work together. If you study patients that I work with, so I'm an intensive care physician, I deal, my goal is to prevent people from dying in the first place when they become critically ill. But unfortunately, whether we like it or not, some people do go beyond the threshold of death. And, and cardiac arrest, it's very important to appreciate, is death. There is no difference between cardiac arrest and death from a biological perspective. So what happens when someone has a cardiac arrest is the heart stops beating, they stop breathing, and within moments, the entire bodily function, including the brain, shuts down. Mm -hmm. So that's how we write the death note we declare someone as being dead. However, through advances in science in the last 50 years or so, we're now able to push back that boundary and potentially bring back a whole person. I won't bore you with the details of how, but CPR being the most basic format, and then there's a lot more to it. So essentially, the reason why this is important is that when somebody's gone through a cardiac arrest, when they've technically gone beyond the threshold of death, we have a situation where whether we like it or not, the brain shuts down. So now, you can study the mind, consciousness, the psyche, the soul, the self, whatever you want to call it, in a clinical context where the brain has been switched off. Now, of course, we would expect there to be no consciousness present when the brain has shut down. That would be common sense. However, over the last few decades, thousands if not millions of people from all over the world have anecdotally reported being conscious, being aware, having memory, being able to see things, and recalling in precise detail what doctors and nurses were doing, conversations, clothing, etc., except they're recalling things from a period when they, their brain had flatlined, they had gone beyond the threshold of death. So what we study is essentially those experiences. We're trying to understand whether those experiences are real. Do they really occur when the brain has shut down, which is a complete paradox? Or is it that perhaps the experience is occurring um, either just before the brain is shut down or after the brain has recovered? However, to go back to your original question, the significance is that if you can demonstrate that consciousness can function when the brain is not functioning, then of course that becomes very important because it tells us that perhaps, going back to the ancient Greek philosophers, maybe Plato was right rather than Aristotle. Okay, well, methodologically I would uh, have some serious questions about how you know that, that that conscious experience, even if it were time to, to when the brain had flatlined, whether that was really indicative of that the, the, that the brain really was flatlined uh, in terms of its uh, capacity to receive information? Or uh, d was the information right before then or right after that? So, I mean, methodologically, it would, it would seem that for such an extraordinary conclusion that the uh, conscious uh, memories or experiences or feelings was truly 
apprehended independent of the physical brain and, 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 and sense organs, and that's an extraordinary claim, you would think that there is some mundane explanation for it. Well, of course, I haven't made any claims. Um, I simply explained where the significance of the work is because one of two things is going to come out of this. Um, either you're going to demonstrate that in, in, in essence what you said, that the experiences are occurring when the brain is online and somehow the brain is functioning and the experience is occurring. However, if you look at what people say, those who've gone through it, there is at least a justification to be open-minded and study this and be willing to accept whatever comes out. So again, if we demonstrate the experience occurs when the brain is online, then it's perhaps more suggestive Before that... Before or after, yeah. That's right, that the experience is being formed uh, through the brain. However, if you can also demonstrate that the experience is occurring when the brain, brain is indeed offline and non-functioning, then you have to uh, question our paradigms, our concepts about the relationship between mind, consciousness, and the brain. I'm going to assume that what you say uh, is correct, that, that the consciousness can apprehend information without the brain, which is during this period of flatlining. If that were true, I, I don't believe that, but I'm going to make the assumption that that's true. Um, wouldn't that be occurring all the time? Would, wouldn't it be occurring now? Wouldn't my consciousness being able to do things outside my brain all the time? Well, just to sort of address the first point that you made, um, it's important to... Uh, appreciate that um, you know consciousness is a difficult area to study and I, and I, I realize that Everybody. unfortunately a lot of what I hear people talk about is more of what I classify as philosophical debates mm -hmm. and of course you can always debate anything that one wants to you know we could argue things away whichever way we want you know lawyers are great at that right but in science we're looking for empirical evidence we're looking for evidence to sway our decision now, if you look at the study of cardiac arrest, people who have technically gone beyond the threshold of death, uh, there are now a number of cases that have come through, and we've also found them in our studies, where um, particularly we can pinpoint that consciousness appears to be ongoing when the brain has shut down, and people are able to verify specific details what was happening uh, during that period, which tells us that awareness consciousness has not shut down, even though the brain has shut down. Do we need more research? Absolutely we need more research because it's a very, very difficult area to study. Because if you look at it, uh, first of all, the people who go through cardiac arrest, as I said, they have died. And so most of them we cannot bring back for various reasons that I won't bore you with the details. Of those people who come back, they, their brain immediately, once you restart the heart, their brain immediately swells up, becomes inflamed, mm -hmm. and the inflammation goes on for at least 72 hours. Mm. And so, of course, it's going to impact your memory circuits. Added to that, physicians such as myself, well-meaning, will give patients drugs, all of which wipe out your memory circuits, right? So now, you look at people, say, two or three weeks later after they've recovered, and now we're trying to gain, uh, gain information from them from that period when they were unconscious, when their heart had stopped. Yet, we've done all these things to wipe out their memories. Mm -hmm. So, the issue is that most likely, more people have these experiences, but they are wiped out due to the various effects that occur afterwards. However, to sort of go back to your sort of point about this, of course, if it is occurring, as you said, if consciousness can occur independent of brain function, why doesn't it happen more often? Well, the fact is, as I explained, the limitation we have is that under almost every circumstance, except for clinical death, brain and consciousness are intricately linked together. Mm. So you can't really switch one off and study the other one, except for this circumstance. So if, for example, if it occurs in cardiac arrest, it doesn't mean that it doesn't occur at other times. It's just that you can't separate them out. Mm. They're so bonded together that we link them immediately. If you were sure that your hypothesis, that consciousness exists when the brain is flatlined during this period of death, before they are resuscitated. What would the implications of that be for what consciousness is? Well, if we can demonstrate that consciousness can continue when the brain is not functioning, then this is very significant because what it tells us is that that entity we call the self-consciousness, the psyche, the soul, whatever you want to call it, is in essence, it's not magical, it's not some weird thing, it's a scientific entity, and it most likely has some type of materiality, some sort of physicality, except that it's so subtle 
that we don't yet have the tools to be able to measure it. So in the same way that uh, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, we didn't have MRI scans that could delve into the brain for up to a couple of millimeters of accuracy, today we don't have the technology to be able to measure thought, to measure consciousness. But it undoubtedly exists. If you think of electromagnetic waves as an analogy, it's a very subtle type of force. It exists right now in this place that we're talking. It's conveying sound and picture from all over the world around us, yet we don't have the receptors to be able to pick it up. But it is very similar to consciousness because it conveys sound, pictures, memories, all the rest of it, right? So essentially, if we prove, if this is proven through science, that consciousness can exist independent of brain function, what it simply tells us is that the brain is vital, but it is not the producer of consciousness. The brain acts more like the TV set. If we were to take a TV and put it here right now and switch it on, we'd see all kinds of sounds and pictures. But it doesn't mean they're being produced by the TV set. They're coming from somewhere else. And of course, if you were to show a TV set to a two-year-old or to a dog, they would think the presenter is sitting in the TV. You see little puppies go and they, if they see a dog, they start like, you know, playing with it, they think it's there. And if you were to be limited, if we, as we are today, we don't know how the whole thing works with consciousness, you could obviously say that I believe people are in the TV set and you could test your hypothesis by going to the back of the TV, putting a couple of wires out and you say, look, I just lost the sound. I just lost half the picture. I just lost, I got fuzziness on it. Therefore, this is all produced from the TV. And that's what we're doing with the brain. Of course, if you get brain lesions, if you get damage, a stroke or any kind of disease, you lose aspects of consciousness. But that doesn't mean the consciousness was produced from the brain. It could be but it also may be that it isn't. And essentially, that's what we would be able to demonstrate, whether it is, is the brain the producer of consciousness or is it simply a conveyor?